Bible reading this evening is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 to 34. Starting at verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then... Those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now, when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptised for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, then why are people baptised for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I die every day. I I mean that, brothers, just as surely as I glory over you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus for merely human reasons, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. This is God's word. Well, it's a great privilege to be able to share God's word where continuing on in our series in 1 Corinthians and we're nearly at the end and um, yes a welcome to Scott and Abby back from America it's good to see you guys here great to have you back all right well stay open in 1 Corinthians 15 and before we jump into it let's pray our great God we ask for your help right now we need your Holy Spirit to work in us because our eyes quickly turn to other things and quickly turn away from your word and quickly turn away from seeing you, God, and who you are. So please, may you send your spirit and may he bring conviction and may he open our eyes to see who you are, God, and to see the hope that we have. And may your Holy Spirit work in us and convict us, God, in the ways that you know we need. And we pray right now, God, that you would be readying our hearts to hear your word and to sit under your word. There's many distractions that may be on our minds and in our hearts. We pray that you would clear them away and that you would give us the attention that is needed, the humility that is needed to understand your word and to submit to it and to live it out. And we pray all of this, God, for your glory and because of all that we have through Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, in this passage here in 1 Corinthians 15, as we look at it, we see there's a problem here with the Corinthians, and Paul sets out to address this problem. 
And verse 12, it shows us straight up what the problem is. Have a look at verse 12. It says, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? It's very clear the issue that Paul is dealing with. Some of the Corinthians did not think that believers would be physically raised after they died. That's what some of the Corinthians were thinking and that's what they were hearing from other people. Now, as we look around at ourselves, do any Christians here think that? Well, probably not. We, we would say we're well-grounded in the truth and we don't believe in this kind of wrong doctrine. We all know we will one day be raised again, we'll be given a new body with no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering. We all know this. And so we sometimes may distance ourselves from passages like this. But I don't think we can write off this passage because of that. As I studied this passage, I began to wonder if we really are any different to the Corinthians and how they were thinking. And as I was thinking on this passage, I was thinking about the reality of how our lives and what we do actually shows what we believe. What people really believe about doctrine and God's Word and who He is, it shows not in what they claim to believe, but in how they live and in what they do. People can say they believe one thing. They can claim they believe something about God, but when it comes to doing it, they really show whether they do believe that about God and whether they do believe that doctrine that is in God's Word. So the test for us to see whether we really believe that we will one day be given resurrected bodies, the test for us is to see whether we really live like there is a resurrection now. Do we really live like we will be given resurrected bodies? We may know the truth that we'll be resurrected, unlike some of the Corinthians who weren't sure of this, who were doubting this, but do we really believe it and act like we believe it? Or do we just say, verse 12, with our lives, and say there is no resurrection from the dead because of how we're living. I think so many Christians at times, myself included, can live as if there's no future hope, no future resurrection, but only this life, only right now, only this moment. And we as Christians need this way of thinking and living to be shattered in our lives. We need it to be gone and shattered in our lives. I know that I do, Living for this life, it is so ingrained in us. It saturates our thoughts. It seeps deep into every decision that we make, living for this life. We're so bound to living like we have no future beyond what we have now. And we are so consumed with indulgent lives of ease, comfort, pleasure, and security. But Paul sets out here to shatter this kind of thinking. And I hope he can shatter this kind of thinking in us as well as we look at the arguments that he makes in this passage to shatter that kind of thinking. So let's have a look at the passage. The first point, the big point that we see in verse 12 to 19 is that if the resurrection isn't true, if the resurrection isn't true, then Christianity is futile and empty. If the resurrection isn't true, Christianity is nothing. Verse 12 to 19. Here in these verses, Paul, he builds and he keeps building to make this case to show that we will rise from the dead one day. We will be given resurrected bodies. And he does this by showing that their claim that no resurrection from the dead is going to happen, their claim that there will be no resurrection from the dead, he shows that that is deadly and that has serious implications. And that's what we're going to see in these verses. He makes it clear here. And he shows about four times first up that if they don't believe in their resurrection from the dead, then Jesus hasn't been risen from the dead. That's the implication. And if this is true, if that's true, that Jesus wasn't raised, then Christianity falls apart, completely falls apart. So look with me at verse 12 to 19 and look at the verses as I quickly go through it because I I just want us to skim through it. I'm not going to read all the verses. I'm just going to skim through it and see the argument that Paul is making. Have a look there, verse 12. Verse 12 there claims, if Jesus did rise, which verse 11, 1 to 11 have proved, as Nathan went through last week, Jesus did rise. If Jesus did rise, how can you Corinthians say that we won't? Is what Paul says. 
And then so verse 13 goes on and he says, if we won't be raised, then Jesus won't rise from, then Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Both go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other, Paul is saying. And so then he goes on in verse 14. But if Jesus hasn't risen, which is what you Corinthians are inferring and saying when you say that believers won't rise, if Jesus hasn't risen though, which you infer by saying that we won't rise, then preaching and the Christian message is useless, he says in verse 14. We have no hope in what we preach. We have nothing to put our faith in if Jesus hasn't risen, because Jesus' death and resurrection is our hope. And if he didn't rise, then Christianity is vain and empty. And therefore, Paul goes on in verse 15. He says, if this is true, then they're misrepresenting God. He's saying, we, the apostles, we who are teaching about God and the gospel, we are liars if Jesus didn't rise. Because they were saying that Jesus rose from the dead and provided forgiveness. But they're liars if he didn't rise. And then in verse 16 to 18, Paul gives some similar arguments again. He really builds his case and wants to make it so clear. He says again, if the dead aren't raised, then Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we're still in our sin. We're not saved. And as well, he goes on, those who have died have perished forever. They're lost and under God's judgment and have no hope. That's Paul's argument. And so in verse 19 then, he concludes there in this section and says, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. If what the Corinthians think, which we saw in verse 12, if, if what they think is true, then we only have hope in this life as Christians. And if our hope in Jesus only brings what we have now in this life, if our hoping and trusting in Jesus only brings what we have now, then we are to be pitied as Christians. How terrible it is, he's trying to show, for someone to devote their whole life to God's eternal kingdom, only to find out that this life was their only hope, and they actually didn't have anything to come. How terrible that is. But, but the sad reality for us is actually the fact that we who have a future hope, we who do have a future hope, live at times as though this life is our only hope. That's the sad reality. We look no different to those who aren't saved, who have no future hope. Our days look so similar to unbelievers, and they struggle to see any difference between our life and theirs. And the world doesn't pity us because for how we live for eternity. They don't pity us because many Christians don't live as we should, hoping in the life to come. Instead, we are consumed, as I said, with security and safety and pleasures and spending all so that we can have the self-fulfillment that we want now. But if we as Christians, if we as Christians lived as we should, looking forward to our future hope, then people should say to us and say about us, what a sad situation. What a fool. They are the worst off of people. How terrible. They waste away this life. That's what people should say about us if we really live as Christians are meant to live with their future hope in mind. People should see us and think we are stupid because we're living for eternity. And they should think we're fools for how we do that because they only hope in this life. So you need to check here. You need to check your life. And you need to ask, does your life say to people that right now, that this life is your only hope? Does your life say that in how you live? Does the way you act show that you, you don't really believe in a future resurrection? And if that is what your life is saying then by your life, Paul said, has said here, you're actually saying as well that you don't believe Jesus has risen. If you're living in a way that shows you don't really think there's a future hope and resurrection and life to come, you're also saying you don't believe that Jesus rose. And you are saying that what you believe in is empty. You are saying that the Christian message is useless 
You are saying that Jesus isn't worth it and all that He's accomplished and all that is to come isn't worth it. And I think we too often say this, not with our mouths, but with our lives and in how we act. So what is going to snap us out of this? What will snap us out of this tendency that we have to live as though this life is our only hope? Well, in these verses, Paul has shown here eight horrible implications that come about if we think and if we act like we are not going to be physically raised. Here's eight implications here that Paul shows to the Corinthians that come about if they think that their bodies won't be raised one day. And I think seeing this should snap us back into reality and cause us to live for that future hope. So I'm just going to quickly go through them. There's eight reasons here, eight things here that come about if we are not raised, if our bodies are not raised. The first one, verse 13, if we aren't raised, well, Jesus wasn't raised. Verse 13 and 16 show it. Secondly, if we aren't raised and Jesus isn't raised, then our preaching is in vain and useless. The message of salvation is empty. Thirdly, verse 15, our message is false. The message of the gospel is false. Fourth, our faith is futile and useless. Verse 14 and 17 show. We have nothing to trust in and put our hope in because Jesus didn't rise. Fifth, we're still in our sins. Verse 17 shows. If the resurrection didn't happen, then the death of Jesus wasn't effective and we're still in our sins and not saved. Sixth, those who have died, those who have been lost, those who are Christians and have died are perished, are perishing and will be lost forever. They will not escape God's judgment. Verse 18 shows. Seventh, the seventh implication, we are to be pitied as Christians. If we live for life to come, but only have this life as our hope, because Jesus didn't raise and we don't have a resurrection, we are to be pitied. And number eight, the final implication is that we have no hope beyond this life. This is what comes about if we think that we have not been raised or will not be raised one day. This is what Paul wants to make clear. These eight things are the reality for the Corinthians if they think they will not be raised. But it is a glorious thing. It seems pretty bleak so far what Paul has painted here but it is a glorious thing to know that those realities aren't true because Jesus has risen. And verse 20 says it so strongly. Verse 20 says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. This brings us now to our second point. In verse 20 to 28, we see here that Jesus has risen and He has conquered. In, in verse 12 to 19, you would have seen there, as we went through it and went through the argument, Paul has raised a whole lot of ifs, a whole lot of ifs. But now he he's shows something that he is certain of, and that is the fact that Jesus has risen. He's risen from the dead. He really did. He's already shown it at the first part of the chapter. And if this is true, then all those ifs that he said back in verse 12 to 19, they're not real. They are not real. In light of verse 20 and the fact that Jesus has risen, it changes all of those things that we saw in verse 12 to 19. And rather than being negative things, they turn into positive realities that are true for the Christian. Have a, have a quick look as I flip them and we go back and see what kind of hope we have because we know that Jesus has risen. Have a look. Firstly, we know that our preaching is meaningful. It is use, it's useful. It is effective. We know that the message of the gospel that we preach is true. Thirdly, because Jesus has risen and we will be raised, we know that our faith is firm. It is grounded on something that is firm, Christ himself and his resurrection. Fourth, we know that we aren't in our sins if Jesus has risen. We are forgiven. We know that we will not eternally perish under God's judgment. And we know that our living for eternity will one day prove that it was worth it. And finally, we know that we have hope beyond this life. If, if verse 20 is true, then all the negative things that were raised in verse 12 to 19 become true, positive things for us and wonderful things of hope because Jesus did rise 
and we will too. Because we will follow in his footsteps. And this future hope, this future hope that we have, that we will one day rise, it it needs to change everything in our lives. And that's what the Bible keeps showing again and again. Let me read just two verses that show how this future hope changes right now. It changes right now. Romans 8, verse 18, Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And similarly in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, he says, For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So though right now we may face great difficulty, we long and hope and wait for something far greater. And so we are not to be pitied. We should not be pitied by others when we risk it all for Jesus, as verse 19 showed. We shouldn't be pitied because it's actually all worth it. All that we go through is worth it because of what is to come. But, but I know that in our life, I know for me, in my life, it, it's not easy to live for eternity. It's not easy to live for God's kingdom. It's a struggle to live for that greater glory of what is to come whilst we're in this world. And Paul knows this too. And in the rest of this passage, Paul further confirms the reality of our resurrection to help us live for this greater glory and this greater hope that we have. So let's keep looking at these things and confirm that certain hope that we have so that we would be strengthened to live for eternity and what is to come. So let's keep going through the passage there. We're at verse 21 now. And here in verse 21 to 22, Paul shows that all are in Adam. And because of this, all have inherited sin. But also he says, in Jesus, all are made alive. Now now we need to realize here that all in the second part of the verse there, it has to refer to those who belong to Jesus. Not everyone. And that's how verse 23 clarifies verse 22. It says those who will also be raised, they're the ones who belong to Jesus. So those who will be made alive are those who belong to Jesus. And we can be sure of this as Christians, that we will receive a new resurrected body, that we will be made alive when Jesus comes, and we can be sure of it, as I've said, because Jesus rose. That's what Paul keeps on saying. He keeps bringing us back to the same reality And in verse 23, he says it again, because he says that Jesus is the first fruits. And what he means by this is that Jesus' resurrection was a preview of what will happen to us. The first fruits were those, the first things you picked from the crop, and you knew the rest of the fruit, the rest of the harvest is going to come if you're collecting the first fruits. It's like when you see a strike of lightning, you know the sound of thunder is going to come unless there's too much noise and you can't hear it. Maybe the the kids are screaming and you can't hear it, but there should be and there is the sound sound of thunder. Or maybe at school, I remember, if the cool kid walked past, you know there'd be the group following them. It's always what happened. They were always following the cool kid. And here we know, if Jesus was raised, then we will be raised as well. It's a certain reality and we will be given new bodies. And then after this, What's the future? What what does the future hold? Well, verse 24 to 26 show us. Have a look. After this, it says, Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So Jesus will one day rule over all authorities. He he will destroy all powers and authorities that are against him. And even death will be destroyed. Revelation shows this so clearly. Revelation 20 shows that death will be thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation 21 shows that we will no longer fear death. We will no longer see death. There will be no death in the resurrection and in the new creation because we will have resurrected bodies that will not perish or die. 
And so death, even that enemy, will be done away with and Christ will reign over and conquer. And then in verse 27 to 28 in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul shows why Christ will reign over all and why he does reign over all. You can, you can look there, I won't read them for the sake of time, but you can see there, why does Christ reign over all? Well, Paul says it's because God has put all under, all under his authority. Everything is under the authority of Jesus. And so he will able, able to be able to rule this world in a way where he will conquer all and conquer death as well. But Paul clarifies, when he says that, he, he's not saying that God is under Jesus. You, you notice there, he says in verse 27 to 28, No, God isn't under Jesus. But instead, verse 28 says, Jesus will be made subject to God. And by this is all he's saying is that Jesus, in his role, is subordinate to God the Father. In his role, he is subject to God the Father, but he is still equal to God in essence, in his deity, because Jesus is God. But in his role, he is subject And then Paul shows right at the end of verse 28 that all of that must happen and all of this will happen so that God may be all in all. It's an interesting phrase, but all that Paul is meaning by it is that God will have authority over all things for all eternity. He'll have authority over everything for all eternity. Calvin says it like this. He says, all things will be brought back to God as their alone beginning and end, that they may be closely bound to Him and under Him. So the point here in these verses, they, verse 20 to 28, seem like they jump around a little bit, but the point here is that Jesus has risen, He will conquer, God will be all in all, and because of that, we can be confident of our future resurrection. That's the point Paul wants to make. And then we get to our final point in verse 29 to 34. Verse 29 to 34, I've summarized this point under this heading that our lives confirm the resurrection. Our lives confirm the resurrection and therefore we must avoid those who hinder our holiness. It's a hard one to summarize, but we're going to see here that our lives and Paul's life and some of the examples he brings up confirms the resurrection and that we will be raised from the dead But also he gives a warning in here to avoid those who hinder our holiness. So let's have a look at these verses. Verse 29, have a look there. Verse 29, it's an interesting verse. It says this. Now if there is no resurrection, what will those those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? Now, it seems this is a practice going on in the Corinthians. It may be that people were being baptized for those who had died and hadn't been baptized, or it may be that they were getting the the bodies of those who had died and baptizing those bodies. We're not sure. But what when Paul raises this here, we need to realize he's not raising this to say this is a good thing. In fact, you can see in verse 29, he distances himself from this and he says, those who do this. I'm not part of this. Those who do this. He's not saying it's right, but he's raising this point and and picking up on this practice to show that if they are doing this, then they must see that the dead will be raised. Why would they do this if they weren't? This would achieve nothing. Why would they do this if there was no hope beyond? Why would they do it? That's the point Paul's trying to make. And then next, in verse 31 to, uh, 30 to 31, Paul raises his own experience and the experience of other Christians to further confirm the reality that we will be raised. He says this, verse 30 to 31, And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I die every day. I mean that, brothers, just as surely as I glory over you in Christ Jesus our Lord. What Paul is saying is this, he's saying, why do we as Christians risk it all if we have no hope beyond death? Why do we risk it? Paul is making the point that he goes through dangers every hour, he risks death every day. Why would he do that if he didn't have a future hope? 
if he didn't have the hope that his body would one day be resurrected and that he would spend eternity with Jesus? Why would he risk it? And, and he goes on to, to make this point even clearer and he brings up an, an exaggerated example in verse 32 to prove his point. He says, If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus for merely human reasons, what have I gained? Notice right at the beginning he says, if, if. This is a hypothetical and it's an exaggerated example. Back then, people would be put into arenas for entertainment. Sometimes criminals would be, sometimes others, and they would be killed by animals for entertainment. But, but nothing in the records in, in the New Testament or other records show that this happened to Paul. Um, and, and we see here this phrase is sometimes used in other places in a metaphorical sense, as, a, as an exaggerated example to show the great dangers that people go through. And I think that's what Paul's doing here. He's bringing up a hypothetical example to show even if he went through the greatest of dangers in his life, if he went through the greatest of hardships, but it was just for human purposes and for nothing eternal, he would gain nothing. He said similar things as well in 1 Corinthians 13. And the point in all of this is, why would Paul risk it? Why would Christians risk it and risk their lives if there was no resurrection. They wouldn't. They wouldn't. And the challenge for us from this is that we should risk it all. We should be really willing to risk it all and be ready to die for the gospel because we will be raised, because we do have a future hope. That's the challenge for us. But if we aren't to be raised, well then just live for now. And that's what verse 32 says. As some were saying, it says, if the dead are not raised, well, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. If there's no resurrection, that's what we should do. And we aren't free to risk it all for Jesus if if there's no resurrection. We aren't free to make costs and sacrifices in His service if there's no resurrection. But there is a resurrection. Jesus rose, and we will too. And so we are able to risk it all for Jesus. And risk is so right for the Christian. We can endanger ourselves every hour. We can risk death with courage every day. Because death is not the end. And we have a future hope. So let me ask you, do you risk it for Jesus? Do you risk your life in some way for His kingdom? Do you risk your life, your money, your pursuits, what you want to gain in life? Do you risk your safety, your possessions, your reputation for God's kingdom? Do you risk it for Him? Because if you have the reality of the resurrection and have that hope, you should. You should risk it for Him. And something is wrong if we don't as Christians. Something is wrong in us us if we just look the same as everyone else in the world. Something is wrong in us if people don't pity us because of how much we invest into eternity and risk it for God. Something's wrong. Something is wrong if we live like this life is our only hope. It isn't and we need to show it. Well, just to conclude now, verse 33 to 34, there's a couple more lessons here I think we need to see. In verse 33 to 34, we see here Paul warning the Corinthians. He warns the Corinthians to stay away from those who were teaching false things about the resurrection. That's the context of these verses. Have a look at verse 33 to 44, uh, 34. 33 to 34. Paul says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. The Corinthians, they have been deceived to think something false. They've been deceived to think that they won't be resurrected, as we've been seeing. And it seems that they've been deceived because they've been around bad company that has taught this and taught wrong things. And so Paul here calls for them to wake up, believe what is right, stop being ignorant of what is true, and wake up. And don't be around those who are causing them to think in this wrong way. 
And this here should remind us and challenge us to be careful of who we are around. To be careful that we are around those who cause us to live for our future hope. We need to watch who we're close with. If you don't come away from a friendship wanting to live for your future hope more, if you don't come away from spending time with a friend wanting to love Jesus more, then you really need to watch how much time you spend with that friend. Yes, we need to put time into helping those who are weak. Yes, we need to put time into those who are not saved. But we also need to watch that our dear close friendships that we grow from are those who cause us to want to come away living for eternity and loving Jesus more. If we don't watch that, then we will be corrupted, as the Corinthians were. You will take in, you will take in the aroma of those around you. That's what Paul is saying. Just like you take in the aroma of a fire when you're around a campfire, you take in the smell of smoke, you'll take in the aroma of those around you. Your friends will either pollute you with the smell of sin or they will fragrance you with holiness. And so that's why we must watch who our our dear close friends are and who inputs into our life. We need to watch who surrounds us. Well, as we close now, I want us to just return back to that thought I said at the beginning of how our lives show what we believe. What we do shows what we believe. All of life is interconnected and it was the same for the Corinthians and we're seeing this in this passage here. Notice in verse 34, Paul says to the Corinthians that they need to stop sinning and he said in verse 33, bad company corrupts good morals. Why does Paul say this? Well, he's showing that doctrine is connected to life. Paul's been trying to correct their view of the resurrection He's been trying to correct their view that they don't realize that they will be one day raised. But we see here he gets to the end and he's actually correcting holiness, a lack of holiness in them as well. And it's because their failure to believe the right thing about how they will be raised has affected their life and how they live. Doctrine and how we live are so connected. And that is why we too, we need to be so certain of our future hope. We need to be so certain that Jesus was raised and that we will be too, because when we do, it changes how we live. It changes everything. It gives us reason to live a holy, sacrificial life. It allows us to serve God no matter the cost. It frees us to risk it all in this life for Jesus because of our future hope. So we need to know what is right in God's Word, if we are to live in a right way. Now, one example of this, as I close, one example of this, of people who have lived and shown that they really believed there is a future resurrection. It's a missionary family that I know. And for me, their lives have shouted out to me that they will one day be raised and that they really believe it. They sold their house, they sold all they had, to give to those who are in need, physically and spiritually. They pour out their lives into the night, serving others. Every day they risk their health, at times even risk their safety as they face war around them for the sake of others. They live far from family, far from security, far from comforts, far from so many things that they would enjoy in this life. They give up their lives to serve others. They eat eat foods that I probably wouldn't want to eat and even risk going through malnutrition for the sake of others. And it's because they really believe in a future resurrection and they live like they really believe it. So, church, friends... The challenge that God lays on us here from this passage tonight, the challenge he lays on us is to live like a fool in the world's eyes. Live like a fool in the world's eyes because you are so focused on eternity and living to please him. 
look like a fool in the world's eyes because of how focused you are on eternity. And so ask yourself these two questions. Does, you, does how you live say that this life is your only hope? Is this life your only hope? Or does your life proclaim that you believe in a future resurrection which was purchased for you by the death and resurrection of Jesus? Does your life proclaim that, that you believe in that future hope? I pray that it would for all of us. Let's pray. Father, what a wonderful reality reality that this chapter shows that Jesus was raised and what power there was in his resurrection what confirmation there was that his death was effective for us and what hope it gives us that we will eternally be saved, that we will one day be raised and given new bodies free from the corruption of sin to live in eternity with you. What a hope that we have, God. Help us to live in light of eternity. Help us to live in a way that shows and proclaims and shouts out to this world that we have a wonderful hope. Please, God, help us to live like this for your glory alone. Amen.